Welcome everyone to the BMW CCA M chapter webinar, Let's Talk Car M Cars with EAG. I'm Matt Anderson, BMW CCA M chapter governor for the North Central. A little bit about myself first. I bought my uh, first BMW in 2006 and later joined BMW CCA in 2014. The same year I bought my first M car, which happened to be a, a great M3. And I don't know exactly why I let eight years pass missing all the great BMW CCA events, discounts at the local BMW parts counter, and vehicle rebates. So I encourage you to join BMW CCA. And if you're already a member of your local chapter, please add in chapter as a secondary to take advantage of our content and events. Details are on our website, Facebook, and Instagram. With that being said, the board, Martin, Eve, Esteban, and all of the governors across the country are pleased to welcome Eric Keller, CEO and founder of Enthusiast Auto Group, for a conversation on his BMW preservation company. We're gonna also talk about the various M3 generations with the sixth generation now being delivered across the country. And if you're on camera, you can see Eric's not in his office like me. He's graciously offered to give us a tour of one of his super secret warehouses. So Eric, thanks for joining us. Can you give us a, a history of where uh, EAG started? Hey, thanks guys. Uh, hey Matt, uh, welcome everybody. Um, appreciate uh, the opportunity and um, I'm super excited to share uh, our super secret warehouse number one as we call it uh, with everybody. Uh, EAG is the quintessential entrepreneurial uh, college dorm room startup that uh, was basically the way to turn my hobby and passion and um, I just love for these cars into my uh, career that turned into obviously a uh, well full-blown addiction at this point. Uh, this is me uh, talking to my fellow people around uh, uh, the uh, the circle here at our meeting, uh, <laughs> sharing with other like-minded uh, BMW addicts that uh, share this passion for these cool cars. And uh, it, it really was um, kind of a blessing to, to turn said uh, hobby and passion into our career. And, and my brother Evan and I, uh, now 21 years in, um, uh, we've, we've built a pretty cool uh, business that is effectively, um, uh, like you said, a preservation company. And uh, we're interested in, in keeping all the right BMWs, specifically the M cars, especially the cars that uh, attracted us to the brand and uh, our, our era of, of cars uh, in, well, the right shape, in the right homes, in, in the right circulation. Um, as, as you know, Matt, with your uh, EAG uh, uh, E90 M3, and, and uh, you know, I think we're up to right around 10,000 or so M cars sold, which I think is, is only on par with, uh, I think the manufacturer is the only place that sold more than, than us at this point. Um, but uh, we're, we're more focused on the quality than the quantity and keeping them uh, in the best shape is what we've built our, our business now set up uh, to do. Um, and it all started really with, with that first experience uh, with, with an E28 M5, um, kind of like, uh, actually, well, not like this one. Uh, it was not anywhere close as nice as that one. Um, but it was that experience, though, that uh, really kind of gave me the idea of, hey, you know, uh, maybe we should uh, focus on doing it better and uh, having a service business that isn't going to take advantage of the situation as, as unfortunately uh, I went through in, in my first experience with an E28 when I went for an oil change and $4,000 later, it came out with all kinds of stuff I didn't think I needed it at the time and, and uh, didn't really approve, but uh, that's a different story for a different time. But uh, we, we now are uh, set up with um, uh, six different facilities or buildings uh, here at the main campus uh, doing the preservation work, of, may, of course, for all of our cars that we sell. But we have cars that are shipped in from all over the country at this point. Actually, I should say all over the world. We've got some cars from uh, Canada and, and down south and uh, Europe uh, on the books scheduled as well um, to, to basically benefit from the experiences that we've learned and dealing with a couple hundred of these and a couple hundred of those and seeing the best of the best and, and working on them today, you know, 10, 20, 30 years removed from the factory production and understanding what the, the challenges are both on the calendar, but also with miles and, and uh, seat time and, and, uh, just attrition. I mean, machines all wear out eventually and you got to sharpen your knife every once in a while if you want to uh, cut nice and smooth. So we definitely are um, pretty blessed to, to be able to do it with great people though that 
share the, the passion and the hobby. And, and so our, our Reju program, putting these cars through the same program we put our inventory through really has become our mainstay and our main business these days. And, and we're really ramping up and, and growing and adding more staff and more resources literally uh, every couple of weeks um, uh, at, a, at a pretty good pace here lately uh, to keep up. But uh, the driving experience with that E28 M5 though is what uh, really got me hooked to the M brand. And, and now I, I've just uh, been living and driving M cars every day since. It's, it's been a really great experience. Yeah, you certainly are living a lot of BMW enthusiasts like myself's dream. So you built this passion around preserving BMWs buying them, uh, selling them, keeping folks in the family, also servicing them, uh, doing performance enhancements. If we start to talk about the various M3 generations, can, can you talk about the, the first, the most iconic M3 for, for a lot of us and that and the E30 M3 and what you all are, are seeing and what your view is of, of the e, E30 M3? Yeah, absolutely. Let me see if I can turn this thing around. Um, don't see how I can do that. So I'll just have to wing it. Um, so uh, here in the warehouse, we've got pretty much an M3 with every uh, spec other than the, the new G. Um, the uh, just outside. But it, uh, all I mean the, the race car for the street and you know this car was quite controversial I'm sure at the time uh, it was built obviously to, to go out and win races and that's exactly what it did uh, the, the history I, I think speaks pretty clearly to itself as the winningest race car but it was it wasn't just regular races I mean it was uh, going out doing rallies and, and uh, all the DTM I mean it was the best kind of the most fun kind of racing you can go out and do right um, and so, you know, the, the E30 really kind of set the M3 um, uh, model um, up for uh, a pretty big shoes, shoes to fill for every generation, obviously, after that. And, uh, you know, the, the, the boxy fenders and, and the big uh, uh, purposeful, uh, you know, uh, rear spoiler that uh, obviously adjustable there. And the, I guess I could go this way. It might be a little easier with the Sport Evo trim. Um, you know, it really is just a... a historical car by every measure that uh first car so you know just we got our first week of great spring weather here uh in cincinnati uh, just a couple of weeks ago and then really great this past week and first car out of this building uh well the dirtiest car now in the building is the black sport evo having driven it the last uh a week or so because that just i couldn't i couldn't wait and we got delivery mileage still on the m2 uh cs and and, and uh i still wanted to get the e30 out first so what's that say <laughs> yeah i mean that's it's definitely the, an iconic car that resonates with pretty much every BMW enthusiast. Um, you, you talked about the Sportivo. H how are you uh, importing Sportivos? Are, are you importing them or are they just reselling in the U.S.? Uh, no, we've, uh, we've brought in uh, now, I think, um, 25 or so. I think two or three we've bought have already been in the States. Uh, but the rest um, we've imported from all over the world. This black one here I, I brought in, uh, this was the first one we brought in brought it in from New Zealand of all places and this was in 2015 like literally like the month that turned 25 which is the, is the, the way we bring them in is the 25 year rule uh, once a car turns 25 years of age you can bring it into the United States of any um, uh, build make uh, emissions etc certain states will have other requirements like California wouldn't bring uh, wouldn't allow these to, to pass uh, smog and carbon all that so that is a, a challenge with this, the sporty for example but um, I think um, this particular VIN is, I think, our 25th one of the 600 that are built. Uh, this is our second lowest mileage one we've brought in. This is a 13,000-mile car. Um, we had a different red one that actually had um, 74 miles on it, I think. Um, I know. It was, tw it was exactly 74 miles. <laughs> that, that car was uh, the pinnacle, really. Um, but it gives us a good... Um, uh, measuring stick of what the new ones uh, or the used ones should be like when you're comparing them to new like that we had the um, bmw classic actually go through that one from a to z before bringing it in and, and um uh they're you know the king of the, the e30 food chain um but certainly not uh, inexpensive uh and and like all e30 m3s i mean there's a high rate of attrition they weren't super valuable and expensive um a long time ago, even not, not that long ago, frankly, five, 10 years ago, they were quite a bit more affordable, half, if not less than what they are today. And uh, actually it's more like 
thirty percent of what they were today five six years ago, and um, uh, they've definitely um, become quite the collectible car. And, and uh, but no different than any other E30 M3, they they still get wrecked, they still get rusty, they still have uh, engines that uh, throw a, a rod through the side of the block um, when they hit you know nine thousand RPMs instead of uh, uh, eight when you go for third and grab first. It happens. Um, but uh, definitely um, uh, super great cars that I, I certainly enjoy driving. That's, that's actually uh, the first car I tracked last year was the, the Sporty Evo as well. Um, you know, you get out and use it the way it was meant to be, driven. That's very cool. It's very cool. Uh, I'm going to pepper in some questions, Eric. Um, one, one gentleman asked a question regarding E30 M3 values seem to be particularly high recently, and it doesn't seem to matter – um, the number of miles that, that are on them. Can you speak just a little bit about uh, any sort of current resales you're seeing on the E30 M3s? Sure. Uh, well, the, it's really great with the rejuve side of the business. We get to see a whole lot of stuff that we wouldn't normally see in our inventory. And uh, a lot of the guys that are selling these cars these days uh, will call us um, first and, and say, hey, are you interested in this car? Do you want to buy it? Um, if not, you know, I was thinking about selling it uh, through this medium. What do you think? Can I get some free advice? We're always happy to help. And uh, the E30s that uh, are showing up for the most part that we're not buying and selling are, of course, going through that rejuve program that were purchased recently. And a lot, a lot of the auction sites, of course, bring trailers, the 800-pound gorilla in the room but there are no shortage of other auction sites that are, are moving quite a lot of cars and they all still need to be updated and, and brought back up to, to driver, you know, friendly, reliable status. And uh, you know, mileage is a number, uh, age is a number. And uh, uh, the better you take care of yourself, the better you take care of your car, of course, the, the, uh, the better it's going to take care of you. And, you know, this black sporty though, uh, it has 125,000 kilometers or so, which is, you know, 75,000 miles thereabouts. And, it's nicer than most 10 or 20,000 mile cars that we'll see, but it's had a ton of money and a ton of energy and love put into it both by the previous owners. Um, and, and frankly, not so much by us. It, we just bought it from the right people. And I think that'll be a recurring theme throughout our conversation today is, is finding the right car from the right people uh, is really the best way to, to, to procure the best example and, and having it vetted and gone through uh, certainly by professionals, of course, the next step. But uh, mileage, it's important and there is no way to completely erase all of the miles. Um, uh, and there are things about a higher mileage car that simply will never be perfectly brand new, like a 13,000 mile car with all of its original Cosmoline still in the undercarriage and things. But uh, they certainly will still drive really, really great at 200, 300,000 miles um, if they are cared for well. And, and relative to values, um, you know, th there's definitely a direct correlation in a fully restored car. It's never going to bring what an original car will. And uh, we have really seen, I guess, both sides of it. Because we recently had a Sport Evo that was nut and bolt, basically brand new. The entire catalog of, of everything Sport Evo, when you could get it, was purchased. And, and basically a brand new Sport Evo was created. Uh, had 149,000 kilometers on at the time. And it sold for almost a high water mark. Um, the, the delivery mileage car, of course, sold for more. A fair amount more, um, but it was pretty similar to what the range of this one would be uh, relative to valuation, and um, uh, you know the expense that that previous owner though went to was extreme, and to do it to that level was probably in the not counting the car, probably 140 or 50 thousand euro um, plus the car. So that's 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 a big chunk of change, uh, you know, 50, 60, $70,000. This seems to be kind of the jumping in point for most of the 30 M3s. Um, and, you know, there's a huge difference. I've seen some $50,000 cars that were okay. I've seen some that were terrible. And I've seen some $70,000 cars, people paid 74 that were nowhere near as nice as a decent $50,000 car too. So, the whole two people last standing in the auction room and things. I mean, it's, it's, it's a crazy time right now. And a lot of people are, are uh, with their wallet they love and, and want to have in their garage. I can't say that it's all being done super intelligently all the time. Um, we do a little more research and have a little more patience, but it's kind of hard when there's a you know, seven day uh, auction timer on it. But um uh, yeah, 50 to 70 grand will definitely get you a decent E30 M3, most of the which uh, that we're selling 
we're starting out around the eighty thousand dollar price point. I think we have one right now available at that level, and then they range up to one, one twenty, one fifty for for some of the better stuff. Appreciate those that. Be, it sounds those, like those will be in the strong number two, even getting into the number on Haggerty's. Appreciate that. Um, as you're walking around, I noticed one of my personal favorites, the second generation D36 M3. And I think there, that car has a lot of history when you think about it, comparing the Euro version to the US spec version. Uh, yes, that's it. That's my, uh, the lightweight one of my personal favorites. Can you uh, talk a little bit about the uh, second generation? Sure. Uh, you know, when the, the E36s came out, um, you know, there's a little bit of, um, well, they almost didn't come to the United States market, as many people uh, probably can recall, uh, maybe of which uh, are even on the call that uh, signed that petition that uh, was given to Eric Winsberg to bring that E36 M3 to our market. And, uh, you know, it's definitely a very, very historically important car, uh, chassis-wise. Uh, the E36 was the largest selling M3 to date. And I think there's a fair amount of people that uh, uh, to de this day are still in love with the M brand because of the relationship they had with the, their E36, whether it was a 328 or uh, Evan and I's case, a 325 uh, were our first uh, E36s, first cars in our family, BMW Y's for three series E36s. So uh, we definitely have a lot to thank um, uh, those uh, cars and that chassis for, but uh, you know, not quite the, the same M engine uh, that the Europeans got, but uh, we didn't have the price point to come with it either. And that's probably why they sold so many of them and, and sold well they did. Uh, the lightweights, 126 of those built, um, you know, homologating uh, uh, for a host of different uh, racing. IMSA being the main one. This is a, a PTG wide body, uh, one of the more recent uh, additions to, to our collection that was, uh, frankly, purchased new by the, uh, the owner of BMW San Francisco and, and uh, uh, raced. He never even titled it. It still was on its MSO when we bought it. So uh, I guess we're technically the first owners of the car. Um, but just a handful of these wide bodies uh, built by PTG. And it's kind of cool to have a full race uh, uh, trim spec uh, next to a, uh, a delivery mileage lightweight that's never had all of the GT stuff installed. This car has only 47 miles on it. And this is, um, uh, to the best of our uh, knowledge, uh, the, the pinnacle of, of the, the mark. And uh, again, a good reference point when we're going through and doing our customer E36 work of what it was like uh, Brand new in 1995. Well, we can go and, and look at the direction of the seam sealer as they laid it in the trunk when we were repairing that one that was hit 10 years ago and not fixed exactly right, which is kind of the main stay of our, our paint and body department, uh, fixing other people's work, it seems, uh, uh, getting it right after uh, uh, it wasn't fixed the right uh, way the first time. But E36s were, were certainly a big hit. Uh, uh, still a great driver's car and, and a great car to learn. If you've got any younger drivers wanting to learn the hobby and, and track and, and things, super communicative car that uh, I, I still love jumping in and driving. Uh, not so much that one, but uh, looking forward to getting that one out on track this year. Yeah. Before we uh, move off the E36, uh, I'm a big fan of your YouTube page, and I saw you do an awesome review of the GT. Do you, you all still have that, and what did you think of it? Uh, uh, we we did sell it. It wasn't for sale, but uh, one of our clients saw it. And he had to have it, and he's uh, uh, bought enough cars from us at this point. Uh, we realize that we'll have another GT here soon. Um, uh, he has a lightweight uh, as well, and um, uh, uh, the GT was awesome. Um, you know, a really great car. I mean, it's it's kind of um, a hybrid. It's not as lightweight as the lightweight, but everything that's on the lightweight was was driven from uh, the GT and um, I want to say there was uh, if the lightweight's about 200 pounds lighter than, than the standard the GT is is more like um, 70 to 90 pounds lighter um, but then has the the uprated uh, 295 horse uh, B30 engine the, yeah the, the uh, S50 B30 so it's a 286 normal and then with the group then uh, cams and then hot software it's 295 horse it's a great car. the color is the best part about it though that exterior color is just to die for and the pictures do not do it justice even the lighting in here don't didn't do it justice um uh, really awesome 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 green and i'm not a big green fan um uh until i guess uh, our little green m coupe joined the the ranks but um really a cool car that made fantastic noises it was a cool video to make actually it's i think our second or third uh, highest viewed uh, video to date um, 
and uh, it was a fun one to make for sure. <laughs> it's definitely a pretty unique, rare car. And one thing I like about the videos, uh, you give us an opportunity to to hear them and and you know us kind of live vicariously through you while you're driving around uh, your town. So I really appreciate those videos, and I'm sure everybody uh, listening today appreciates those videos. So thanks for that. Oh, thanks for bearing through them because I have no idea what I'm doing still with that. <laughs> <laughs> Just buy, buy a bunch of GoPros and figure it out. Yeah. Uh, I still don't totally know what I'm doing, but I'm having fun doing it and uh, get to go out and drive and uh, call it work. So uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a win-win. <laughs> yeah, no, I hear you. So if we, if we leave the E36 and move into another very popular M3, it's the E46 uh, coupe and convertible. What are your what are your thoughts on that car? Um, and then what is EAG seeing those come through? Sure. Uh, this is a uh, 06 M3 uh, comp that we bought 12 years ago, thereabouts, maybe 10 years ago. Sold to a local customer, did all the service on it. Uh, ended up buying it back from them. And Evan's like, yeah, I got to keep that one. Uh, we, we just love that car. And, and it's been, I think it's one of the, maybe the second longest uh, uh, tenant in the EAG collection. Um, E46s are awesome. I mean, it's really just, you know, the E36, um, you know, revised, uh, you know, 200 pounds or so more, um, almost 100 horsepower more. But, you know, it, it still had its own controversy when, when uh, it came out. You've really got to run that uh, uh, tack all the way to the end to, to get all of those 333 horsepowers uh, uh, stomping. And uh, it's not a it's not a torquey motor like a lot of the, the AMGs and other you know co competitors' cars were in the period. And and so you know it, it did get a little bit of a I guess um, a controversy, a little bit of pushback as every M3 model has since. Uh, however, um, you know, the E46 is really, especially today, I mean, it really is a very pure analog driving experience. Uh, they, again, made uh, no, no shortage of them, and uh, it, it definitely, uh, uh, oh, sorry, uh, work calls, <laughs> um, uh, definitely a uh, thoroughbred and very successful track car uh, and race car in its own right. Uh, the E46 GTR is definitely one that uh, I doubt we'll ever have the opportunity of owning, but one that we certainly want to have with that V8. Um, uh, the convertibles, uh, uh, also probably my favorite drop top uh, BMW. Uh, I, I actually even like it more so than the Z1. Um, uh, well, the Z1's got the cool factor for days, but the E46 M3, if you're going to go out and drive, I mean, it's a really good, usable four-seat convertible. And you know, the values on these things have been very, very stable, uh, linear uh, in appreciation, which isn't always the case with most used cars. But they, they have been going up in value pretty steadily, um, really, for the last decade. Um, I don't think we're going to see any crazy breakouts anytime soon with E46s, but I, I can definitely say we're going to see a lot less and less examples with good miles coming to market. And when those that do, they're going to continue to probably push the, the needle. And, you know, the best ones are going to cost you six figures these days. Um, uh, it, it's definitely a, a car that you can use and drive and, and it'll do big miles too. Um, no big deal to get two, three, four hundred thousand miles out of them. But, you know, there are a lot of, again, with any used car uh, issues you need to, to be aware of and, and make sure that, uh, you know, the motor's going to hold together and the SMG transmission, which was another big controversial point, of course, with the, with the E46s. And I think it was about overall, I want to say about 55% thereabouts versus the fuel um, between um, both the coupes and convertibles. And, uh, you know, it's basically the same transmission, just obviously with a lot of hardware bolted on top of the SMG um, hydraulic systems and things. And they're not the end of the world. They're, they're, it's, it's an okay transmission, but it does have some issues. And, and if it hasn't been serviced and hasn't been uh, repaired or hasn't had a pump replaced and a lot of other smalls uh, done, I mean, you know, bring your wallet a little bit uh, when you do buy that one that's more original than not if it's got in the mid miles, because you're going to invest in it to, to keep it going in the long term. But uh, I do think think that that's a pretty good place to, to park some money and, and drive and have a lot of fun and, and not lose your shorts. Um, uh, I think that's probably a good thing. You get in now and have five years, a couple thousand miles a year, probably even break even, you might even make some money. Not that that's the yeah. point, but if you have a lot of fun and, and uh, make some great memories, then, then you know, that's a win. Yeah, I've got two questions for you on the E46. Uh, 
actually three. One of them is, is this the model that BMW started to add the competition pack? And if so, how do, how do you feel about, does that, you know, make the car that much better? Is it uh, from a driving experience and, and then maybe from a value perspective? Uh, you kind of broke up there at the first part um, of the question. Sorry about that, everyone. The question was, isn't the E46 one of the first cars BMW put the competition package on? And what are your thoughts on driving a E46 and then an E46 competition or with the competition pack and then values on that? Yeah, okay, got it. Uh, 2,410. Uh, that's how many G46s were made. Uh, again, about 55, 45 uh, SMG uh, versus manual splits. Coupes only 2005, 2006, a lot of years. A lot of the comp, uh, the ZCP package uh, accoutrement were the, the extra bits from the CSL. Uh, a lot of stuff on CSLs lately on the internet these days. Uh, bigger uh, brake setup, a larger, uh, one inch larger rotors up front hotter composite uh, pads and, and discs uh, these wheels which will be a spin cast forged uh, I think not quite four pounds a little more than three pounds, uh, lighter on the front inch polished um, a uh, diamond cube interior trim which will be unique uh, to the comps only and then the steering wheel, which will be the Alcantara. They'll usually have a one button just on the right side there for the M-Track mode. We do retrofit the full cruise control and the audio controls, uh, if so desired, using the factory stuff as, as done here on Evan's car. And uh, the comp package has a, a tighter steering rack too. I think it's a 2.9 turn lock to lock as opposed to a 3.2 lock to lock. And that's probably gonna be the most noticeable difference relative to the driving dynamics. Uh, BMW did market that the compact package had a different suspension, but then again, every uh, uh, late 04, 05, 06 had a different spring rate, and I think they just kind of bundled those things together and called it a, a different, when, when you change the weight of the wheels, the car is going to feel lighter on its feet and give a little bit of a different feel, but the suspension between a comp and a non-comp are the same. Uh, but the steering rack will, will definitely be the biggest, most noticeable difference. Uh, performance, unlike the newer comp, uh, which, you know, every M pretty much since has had a competition uh, option offered and they really pushed that more so from a marketing standpoint than a pure pure uh, competition standpoint, I suppose, uh, maybe with, uh, with these more uh, early ones. But um, uh, the, the power was the same. Uh, the exhaust was the same. Uh, I think the, the most notable things, though, really will be that steering rack and the wheels for the E46 uh, relative to values. Uh, the competitions do sell for quite a bit more money. It was a $4,000 option thereabouts when it was uh, new in period. Uh, you're definitely going to pay more than that delta compared to, uh, you know, um, same two cars next to each other, um, statistically speaking. Um, I guess it really depends on if you're buying a 10 or 20,000, 30,000 mile car or a 130,000 mile car relative to the, the spread between a comp and a non-comp uh, relative to value. But uh, you'll definitely, you'll, you'll spend that $4,000 original uh, uh, MSRP Delta at least. Uh, and, and the lower you go on the mileage, probably the bigger the spread will be. Appreciate that. I've got another question. I think this one's a great question for you, Eric, being a preservation specialist. Uh, this question's from Mary. Uh, she has an E46 ZHP um, and, and, you know, they're ready to step up to a E46 M3. And, you know, mm -hmm. she's test driven some around her local market. And some of them have been modified, some haven't, but she doesn't, she's, you know, it's not just her, it's probably a lot of us. No one really knows what it's like to drive a car back in time. So how do you recommend someone, maybe they see a car on BMW CCA's classified ads. How do you recommend someone buy a car if it's not from you? I mean, obviously we should go to EAG, but if it's not you, how, how do you recommend or how would you answer that? Yeah, sure. Uh, that's a good question, Mary. Um, you know, the best thing, I think, in anything uh, uh, professionally is always to go out and, and find those that uh, uh, do it for a living and are living it every day. And, and whether it's uh, accounting or, or medical field or anything is, is uh, find the best uh, resource that you have access to. And then, of course, bounce it off of them. Um, you know, our, our workshop is certainly uh, at this point, you know, nationally set up, but you can't bring it to us to inspect it when it's in Maryland and you're in 
California and, and uh, you're thinking about buying it. Um, uh, it's tough because you're, you're really limited to, to the perspectives and, and um, experiences of others and, and um, not to discourage, but you definitely want to, to do your due diligence. You want to, of course, go through the service records if you can. You want to have uh, an inspection done by a, a BMW specialist. And Franchise dealers are all fine and well, but when you're talking about a 15-year-old car, which is the newest E46 you're ever going to see is 15 years old still, um, you're going to want to probably talk to somebody that's used to working on 15 and 20 and 30 year old cars because they're going to have a different perspective to do based on, uh, you know, uh, the, the standard um, protocol with the newer stuff. Uh, how do you tell how it drives compared to it's tough? And, and frankly, test drive, uh, it'll give you some indications as to the quality of the car but uh, you know that's the last thing that i do and i'm gonna know how it drives frankly after i go around it I'll check out the cosmetics and of course get under the car and go through it mechanically um you know, we get a lot of calls uh, you know the, the uh, do-it-yourselfers no different than you know how i started doing this is working on these myself um and you know i i I don't want to do any paint and body work, but I can do all the mechanical or vice versa. You know, call me when you get one that's, you know, super great mechanically, but, uh, you know, cosmetically has some challenges or, or vice versa again. Um, and, you know, those cars don't exist. Um, if it's all beat up on the outside, you think they did every oil change at the time they're supposed to do it? Um, really? I mean, come on. No. Uh, it's It's all very congruent. Um, and uh, if the outside's trashed, you can bet the inside of the motor is probably too. I, I, I don't see it being different in the workshop. So uh, the best advice I would give somebody looking to buy a, any used M, I don't think we need to limit it to an E46 M3, um, you know, is you really need to have a really high quality inspection done by somebody that knows what they're doing, not just these general inspection services either. And, and you know, I, I've seen all these inspection reports on these cars that we've bought from all these people over the years. And every car has a record binder. And every single time we buy one of these, Evan and I individually, personally go through every single one of those records. And, and of course, then that goes into our data pool of what questions to ask. And, and uh, you know, customer complains about X, Y, and Z. And what does that mean? Oh, well, that means that car probably overheated. Um, we should probably look in deeper to what those context clues suggest. And maybe we should stay away from that one. And um, uh, it's tough. Um, these are high-performance cars that uh, are meant to go around a racetrack. So uh, I, I, the best advice, I suppose, would, would be patient. That's the best advice. Um, the first one you see, it's probably not the right one. It might be. Uh, blind squirrel uh, uh, will we'll find um, you know, some acorns every once in a while. Um, but, um, you know, uh, you, you definitely need to be diligent and be patient. Have your guard up, uh, rightly so, because you know, everybody's out there, especially these days, as easy as it is to sell cars. And I mean, as e you know, I, mean, I can imagine coming up, if I was 20 years um, younger coming into this as I was 20 years ago, now uh, into the industry and, and selling these cars to, with, with uh, bring a trailer and all the different marketing mediums and, and how easy it is to make a car look good that isn't. Um, you know, this car looks fantastic. This is Evan's driver. I mean, this is, we call it 50 shades of gray um, because it literally is 50 shades of different gray. And you can't tell that probably much in the pictures right now, but uh, it's, it's a 125,000 mile bang around beater car that we have fun with. And look, the paint's all coming off. Um, and, you know, not the end of the world, but that's how we use it and drive it and enjoy it. And if you need to park it at the airport, But, you know, from 10 feet away, sometimes it's going to be all bush us. I mean, every quarter at least I get a car in and I'm supposed to know what I'm doing, right? 10,000 cars Evan and I've bought and here comes this B28 M5 from Canada. And it's like, where's the car I bought? Because this sure is ain't it. Um, and it's like, man, um, I just screwed up. Um, it happens. Um, yeah, it, it's uh, definitely something that it's important to find somebody you know and trust. And, and I think at the end of the day, it's really been a blessing for us for the fact that 
um, there aren't a lot of great shops that have the experience that we do. And, and so cars are really coming from all over the place. Um, I mean, we're many months out to, to book um, rejuves and, and hopefully it's going to go down, but um, weight wise, but uh, uh, there's probably 50 cars at least right now that are here from all over going through. And, and uh, it takes a long time to, to wipe the 10, 20, 30 years off. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, you know, going through and, and uh, putting a supercharger on a high compression motor might not be the best idea for longevity. And, uh, you might be putting a couple more motors in there too. Um, but with every degree of complexity comes another. I don't want to maybe over-engineer uh, things more, um, but uh, you know the, the basics, the intake exhaust software kind of stuff. Uh, of course, you can go through and do the suspension. Good old TC Klein is, is obviously a well-known staple in the industry and one of the best suspension tuners in, in the business. Um, and uh, there's uh, half a dozen cars in this room that has have his suspension on it. Um, and probably a lot of guys and gals uh, at home watching this as well uh, that have benefit from, from uh, experience from engineers that uh, are not necessarily interested in modifying cars, but they're more interested and, and tuning and adding to the performance level of them. I appreciate that. Yeah, that, there's a lot of questions on that. It's um, another one about exhaust. You answered, do it tastefully. Probably the major, la the major label exhausts are the best. Um, that's what. And, and, not, and, and I wouldn't take all labels to be the same relative to the engine. A lot of guys will say, well, Dynan sounds great. On, uh, my, Dynan exhaust sounds great. Yes, but on which application? Um, sounds really great on an E46 M3, but so is an Eisenman. Um, well, does the Dyna sound the best on the M2 or does the Acropovic? Um, so it is a case by case. You know, E39 M5s are a good example because the Dyna actually sounds fantastic on the E39. Every E39 M5 needs an exhaust system of some sort. Those the target market in period for E39s that need that little label in the trunk to show you how to store three golf bags all those mufflers were made for those guys too so they, they definitely need some different mufflers um but uh the dine and the eisenmans uh really sound great on those too so it, it's a case by case but it depends on what somebody wants and and tone or, or, or sorry drone or, or tone or, or uh, vice versa uh there's a lot of different ways to set them up that will give you different results for sure appreciate that um and now i'm looking at the chat box there's been a lot of interest in your new n2 cs can you uh, talk about how that is to drive? A lot of us may not have an opportunity to drive a N2 CS. Can you spend some time on that? I can spend about 33 miles worth of experience on that. Okay. How's that? <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe, maybe actually it might be more like 55 miles. I think, um, I did the performance center, um, uh, delivery, uh, January 11th on a Monday. Uh, my girlfriend and I went down. It was a, a great uh, a trip. Yeah, I got 66 miles on this. Um, and uh, uh, it, I think I had 10 or 11 miles at the time uh, I met the car. And uh, I've got a cool video um, at the delivery center, which you know, I had, I, I'm, I've never been a retail client. I mean, I, don't, I never buy stuff new. So this is a really cool experience. Um, so I, I made sure to do it all. <laughs> so uh, just as uh, Tom uh, Pazinski was buying his EAG retail uh, United 2 here, I'm doing the same thing with uh, uh, him at the performance center with this. Um, and then uh, shortly after I got back, I did a driving video that you'll see on the channel probably in the next week or two. Um, uh, and uh, I, I bought uh, the first M2 right when it came out. I had one of the launch cars um, back in uh, March of 16, right when they came out. Um, it actually uh, it was pretty cool. Um, Alpine white six speed and the last four of the VIN, as I realized that the VIN stickers were all on each individual body panel, just like the E30 M3 North American spec. So of course I got like super excited seeing all my VIN stickers uh, back where they belonged. And uh, uh, the last four were my birth year. I couldn't plan that. And so of course I fell in love with the M2 to the M2 comp uh, for a couple of years after that, 25,000 miles between those two uh, as my daily drivers. And um, having driven all the, the greatest M's built over the, the last, well, since M came about uh, the M2 CS. Uh, yeah. It's, 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 it's wicked. It's, I mean, it's so awesome. Um, it's frankly more, daily drivable, I think, than the comp um, with the adjustable suspension. Um, it's got uh, massive power. Uh, I did a dyne and stuff to my standard N55 um, M2. 
and uh, that car uh, become a good uh, EAG repeat visitor now on its uh, third uh, EAG home, just uh, delivered it last Saturday. That is a good uh, friend, clients up in Michigan. Um, love all the M2s, um, uh, but uh, the M2 CS um, certainly is, uh, uh, it's a significant car. Um, I, I definitely think it's the best car BMW's got going at the moment for the driver. And, uh, you know, throw the carbon brakes and, and uh, of course, we had to get the, the one-off uh, color from Asano um, relative to the others just to be different. But uh, really, really happy with it. But I did find something really cool that uh, us technical, uh, detail-oriented geeks will love. Most of the M2 CSs, they'll have a little wave pattern, uh, like maybe from a heat transfer in the carbon fiber roof, just right there above the B pillars on both sides. We've noticed this on a lot of the CSs. So... Even these days, with all the, the technology that we've got, uh, there is no perfect. And so being diligent when you're buying a used one of these that uh, has a lot more risk uh, becomes, uh, you know, again, um, that much uh, uh, more important to be mindful of. A yeah, um, couple more questions on the chat, then we'll, we'll leave you. Um, any E60 V10s in, around? Uh, we have an E63 V10 right now. Does that count? I think so. It's a V10. It's a M car. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, just brought in a 2007 M6 uh, from the original owner. Um, it's a black black that has uh, a, it hasn't yet hit its 1200 mile break in service. <laughs> You're kidding so, me. Uh, no, it has a thousand miles on it. <laughs> um, so couldn't refuse. Northern California, the, the uh, spouse reached out and said, hey, this is uh, my um, uh, spouse's car and it's uh, low mileage and um, uh, we'd love to, to keep it a good home. Um, you know, the V10 M5s, uh, you know, we, we've had a couple of them, um, not too many. Uh, we, we typically default to the, the later production, uh, you know, 9s and 10s and 6 speeds and certainly they didn't make very many of those. And uh, we just simply haven't seen a whole lot that would hit our quality metric, not enough to, to make it a viable uh, you know, business um, opportunity, I guess would be the very practical uh, answer to that question. Uh, we certainly would be welcoming them open, open arms um, uh, if they do hit those quality metrics, but uh, uh, most of the which that hit those quality metrics aren't uh, necessarily for sale. Uh, those guys are still in love with them. Appreciate that. Um, and I think that's a question. Is that a 850 CSI on your? Yeah, that was a question about that car, the yellow. Yes. Yeah, we got third. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you have one there too. Okay. Yeah, I think we got. Yeah, we got. I think four or five of them right now on property. A couple of euros too. Yeah, this is a euro. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Even though you were kind of ended our M3 generation talk, maybe just close out on the the eight series. What what how do you feel about it? What are your clients looking for and on that model? Sure. Uh, I love 850 CSIs. I love them. It's like an M5 with two doors. Uh, it's really a great, great driving car. Um, but I'll tell you, uh, everything we've talked about doing due diligence and buying the right one, um, multiply that. Um, uh, it, it's it's a difficult car to buy and not have a big surprise. Uh, we are putting typically about twenty grand into the best examples of the 850 CSIs that are still circulating these days in the future proofing efforts. Um, you know, seven to ten grand that stuff they physically need, uh, where the next ten is is the stuff that they're going to need over the next one or two or three years. Um, they're really fantastic cars. Uh, they're beautiful. I mean, it was, I think a almost a billion dollar budget uh, to, to engineer the, the E31 chassis, um, $900 million back in, in the late eighties, if my memory serves. And the, the CSI, you know, it's, it's a McLaren um, F1 bottom end, basically. Uh, or I should say the McLaren F1 bottom end is an 850 CSIs. Um, uh, and uh, was it uh, 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 Fisher uh, was the, one of the engineers, um, Yuta Fisher still works at BMW Classic. Her dad was one of the main engineers of the, of the, the V12 engine. And it's, it's really a, um, it's a really great engine. Um, and it's a super advanced car for the era. 
but try to go boot your 3D6 computer up from 1993 and see if that, uh, let me know how that works for you. Cause there's about 20 of those in that car. And um, it's definitely one that, um, uh, that will have some challenges if it's not been kept up and, and kept on power. You see all these cars have triple chargers on them. Uh, every, every car I think in this entire building does. And that's really important. And that just goes down to the due diligence and caring for your car because once those batteries go dead, all those capacitors on those circuit boards and all those little computers um, lose their charge and they just might not want to wake up that next time after the fourth time they've been completely dead. Batteries work. And um, for the same um, so uh, it's definitely important to buy the right one from the right person. And even then um, do keep some money backed up uh, to, to go through and, and uh, tune it up to, to get it to the quality standard that you require. That's awesome, Eric. Uh, on behalf of everyone, we appreciate you giving us the tour, your expertise. I, I know you're a BMW CCA member, so, so thank you for that. Um, I think a couple common themes resonated. It's always the right car, um, buying it from the right people and you know, leverage experts like yourself. Um, is there anything else you wanna share with us before we talk about our upcoming events? Uh, no, I mean, get out and drive. I mean, uh, share these cars with, with uh, you know, the next uh, round of enthusiasts. I mean, that's uh, what got me into this and probably most of you all too. And, and uh, I think especially these days, uh, there's not, we can't go out and do as much as we used to in our old lives because, you know, life is obviously very different today and it probably will be for the foreseeable, if not inevitable future. And, and uh, I think getting out and, and having fun with the cars and, and uh, doing it um, safely and, and doing it with the club, uh, you know, driving schools, get out and learn how to drive these cars. Um, you know, the street survival program is, is definitely um, one of the best things going that uh, if you've got younger uh, kids, even, you know, your neighbors that aren't even into BMWs, they don't even own a BMW, um, street survival don't care. Um, let's get the kids through those programs so that, uh, you know, they're not uh, sitting around their phones getting ready to, to hit that uh, uh, kid going through the crosswalk or whatever, uh, paying attention to their phone, not necessarily what's going on around them. So, um, uh, yeah, get out and drive and enjoy the cars. And uh, if you need uh, some support along the way or want to keep that right car in the right home or uh, tune it up, uh, you know to call. Appreciate that. Uh, so, everyone, our next event for the M chapter is MX1 uh, the second week of April. And we're doing some caravans. We're, we're driving down. And we're going to have a tent on Saturday at the Cars and Coffee. So, if everybody stops by for, for a T-shirt and, and a sticker, um, are you all going, Eric, to MX1? Yep. Yep. We'll, uh, we'll be there. I have no idea what we're driving. Uh, probably don't even yet know where we're staying, but uh, okay. we are going. Awesome. Well, I hope everybody visits uh, you and us at uh, MX1. And, and like I said, on behalf of everybody at the M chapter, uh, we thank you for what you're doing and we thank you for your time and tour today. So everyone, yeah, thank thanks. Uh, have a good night. Yeah. Thanks for having me. See you guys. Thank you. See you.